Originally called Air Trek in Japan, the Mitsubishi Outlander has had four distinct personalities over more than 20 years. The first one was kind of quirky and quite fun to drive if a little unrefined. The second one really lifted that to a new bar with a new platform and a bit more of an expensive look. The third one, which came out in 2012, was kind of a GFC car that took the old platform and made it look worse and sort of hung around for quite a long time. So this model here, which is new for 2022, needs to do a lot for this nameplate to lift it beyond where it sits right now. If you think about where some of those Korean brands like Kia and Hyundai were when the last one was new, they were all sort of kind of down around Outlander level. Whereas since then, those Korean cars have really soared, leaving the Mitsubishi Motors brand kind of stagnant and much in need of an uplift, which is what Mark IV Outlander is all about. While the new generation Outlander might look completely new for Mitsubishi, not all of the car is new. Being part of the Renault Nissan Alliance means that Mitsubishi has ditched the old GS platform from the last car that had been around since sort of mid 2000s and now uses the CMF CD platform that is underneath the X-Trail, the Nissan Rogue in the US and the Renault Coleos for better or worse. So what we have here is the next generation X-Trail but with a Mitsubishi body. So even underneath the bonnet, this car has Nissan's 2.5 litre four cylinder direct injection petrol tied to a CVT transmission. So nothing unfamiliar and nothing scary about the newness of what's underneath this car. Outside though, it does look very distinctly different. And this model here is the Exceed Tourer, which is the full top of the line model. Underneath it in Australia sits the Exceed, followed by the Aspire, the LS, and the ES. Now Mitsubishi thought that these new top end models would add quite a lot of luster to the brand because this two-tone Exceed Tourer here does look quite striking. It shares those 20 inch yellow wheels with the Exceed and the Aspire below it. But so far, after three months on sale, 39% of people have bought the LS, 38% of people have bought the ES, 5% of people have bought the Aspire, and 16% of people have bought either the Exceed or the Exceed Tourer with this one being the slightly less popular of the two. So seems that value still wins for Mitsubishi buyers. But should they contemplate spending $50,000 on a medium SUV like this that seats seven people? Now, compared to the last Outlander I tested, which was an Outlander plug-in hybrid GSR, this Exceed Tourer here in white diamond pearlescent metallic, inspired by Liz Taylor's fragrance, or not, with a black mica roof, is significantly better built. The paint is actually really nice, has a lovely luster to it, and is matching through all the front panels here, which the last one we drove wasn't. And there's definitely a look about this car that says distinctly, I am new for an Outlander. And while the sizing of these new generation Outlander isn't really that different to before, the wheelbase is only 36 millimeters longer, and it's not that much of a change from the past, it does look very different thanks to the size of this front. This front end look looks to me to be clearly inspired by a US pickup truck. Let us know what you think, but to me that says Americans will love me. And that's not a criticism, it's just that I can't find a quoted drag coefficient for this car because I suspect it may be not very good. Around the side here, the Aspire, the Exceed and the Exceed Tourer in Australia all get these really quite striking 20 inch alloy wheels and they're huge. But I think as we'll discover when we drive the car, they're also probably quite heavy because they do detract from the way it drives. But it turns out nearly 80% of people are buying the one with 18 inch wheels. So this is not so much of a draw card. These Bridgestone Acopia 255-45 R20 tires give this car terrific smooth road grip, but I don't know whether they really say off-road ability to me, even though it does have 210 millimeters of ground clearance, which is actually pretty good for a medium SUV, if not class leading. As for the rest of the Exceed Tourer look, I really love this black two-tone roof. It can also get the car in a black and bronze two-tone as well, but I think the black and white one's kind of very zeitgeist for 2022 and at the back we have a evolution of the Mitsubishi look this is much more sophisticated than the old car that just had the old 2012 models lights on the end with 
extra crap tacked on in the middle. Whereas this one actually has a little bit of scalloping in the tailgate and looks distinctly new and expensive, especially for a Mitsubishi. Enhancing that look of expense is the fact that the Outlander this time has a very minimal amount of badge work because too many badges always says trying too hard. Although this garnish down here, which implies a little bit of power and maybe prestige, has only one insipid little tailpipe hidden under the left, kind of betraying the fact that what's under the bonnet of this car is not exactly going to set the world on fire. In the boot, 478 litres with the seven seats folded down. It's a little bit less than the five seat version. Underneath here, we have the headrests from the third row of seats. And underneath here, we have a space saver spare, which you may have suspected it didn't have, but it does. We also have a little hook here. We have a 12 volt outlet here and easy drops for the back seats for the backrest to go down. Although you will have to remove the headrests if you want it to go flat straight away. But how many soccer balls does it fit? I hear you ask. I'll tell you. So while the LS for MY22.5 has lost its electric tailgate, the Exceed Tourer still has it, it will still take 52 soccer balls just like the Exceed Tourer, which is actually really good. There's no luggage cover though to cover them. Thankfully there's a dark window tint and with the seven seats up with only 163 litres, it wouldn't take very many. But that is really competitive for a medium SUV. The area where the new Gen Outlander really needed to lift its game was inside the cabin, not just its appearance, but in the way that everything operates and feels. The previous one had a couple of nice things and some nice upholstery on the odd variant, but the rest of it was just hard and yucky plastic. And even though this all seems kind of derivative, where a bunch of design details have been sort of amalgamated together to make this car, I feel like Mitsubishi has actually chosen wisely in making the new Outlander look pretty consistent. This sort of piano black band across the middle unifies it so much better than the previous car that just looked like it was from the 90s almost. And a lot of this sort of padded surface, this is all padded across here with this orange stitching in this car. Um, this even along the sides of the console here, also padded. Same with the door armrests, same with the tops of these doors here, although that and the dashboard doesn't really squidge very much. But there is enough tactility in here to pass the Exceed Tour at least off as something that's potentially worth the $50,990 they're asking currently before on-road costs, which is a lot of money for an Outlander. Now, this Exceed Tour gets its own interior appearance. The regular Exceed is just either black or light grey that looks almost white, which would not be good for heavy traffic. Whereas this has this nice charcoal interior with this saddle tan two-tone mixed with orange stitching across the dash on the doors, sort of quilted in the middle here and through the centres of the seats, which are also perforated and proper leather. Now, both front seats in this car are also full electric with electric lumbar support and eight-way adjustment. And because we're in the Tourer, we also get massage for the back. Although I hate massaging seats, I think they feel weird. But for people who love that stuff, then maybe this is your car. I think that all of this works really well together. Even the screen in here in this Exceed Tourer version, because we have a 10 speaker Bose sound system and it sounds surprisingly excellent actually for a regular stereo. It's not full top shelf, but it's really good, handles most bass pretty well. And this just seems to work really well. It flicks between screens quickly. Even having exposed volume knobs here makes it really easy to work. Big volume knob set up for left-hand drive, so it's on that side. And a button here that you can press to go through treble and bass and stuff while on the move. And it lets you do all of that while it's on the move. The audio system is also combined with wireless charging down here. We have one USB-A port, one USB-C port, and a 12 volt outlet. The Apple CarPlay is wireless, so that's also something good. But not all of these screens are entirely attuned with each other in terms of their graphics. The dual zone climate control here with all this digital stuff here looks pretty easy to work. It's actually extremely cold. I've been running at like 23, 24 degrees, and that's several degrees hotter than what I would normally have it. It is amazing. Although we only have seat heating, we don't have seat cooling, which is a shame because we do have 
perforated seats. And in the front here, we have a kind of a mixture of what you would imagine you would get if an Audi TT's virtual cockpit was mixed with something out of a Citroen because you get sort of Audi-esque fonts with the Citroen dial flavor. So you can hit this button here, go to change display view, and it goes from having two barrel dials on the side to going to two sort of flat analog dials that look very much like Volkswagen's and thankfully look nothing like what Mitsubishi would have done before. The other thing I should mention is that the Outlander actually has a pretty good view, even though it has that massive bonnet up front. It has quite a deep windscreen header that sits a fair way forward from the driver, so you actually get pretty good coverage here and you get a really good view ahead, despite the fact that we've got anthracite headlining and quite thick A-pillars. There is actually really good general vision in this car. We also have a standard panoramic sunroof, which is great with an electric blind that goes in two positions, and we have blinds in the doors for the back, which is also really cool. The driver's seat and the passenger seat both get two position memory, and from this position, I also have a head up display. So there's actually quite a lot going on here in terms of equipment. I suppose if I had to really criticize anything, it would be that this steering wheel feels like it's inspired by something out of a BMW M model, which means it's too thick and kind of unsuitable for the Outlander. They should have stuck to something thin and nice and not this. And this gear lever, while looking kind of techy, it seems like it's something out of a Renault, which it probably is. Just the pulsing effect of it is just a little bit kind of, I don't know, unsatisfying. Sometimes you accidentally pulse it into manual instead of drive, and then it revs its tits off rather than almost doing the same amount of revving because we are in a CVT. And here, because we're in the all-wheel drive, we have eco, normal, tarmac, and three more settings for off-roading, plus a hill descent button. So all of that works pretty well too, as you would expect from Mitsubishi's four-wheel drive heritage. We don't get, though, a sliding center armrest here. We just get one that sits back and is actually in a pretty good position. Let's try the rear seat. As I mentioned, we get these cool little blinds in the doors, which are optional in some of the other models. We can also fit this amazing drink in the door back here, just like we can in the front, which is pretty good. But the overriding impression about the back seat, or should I say the middle row of this seven seat Outlander, is just how amazing my view is. I am way higher than both front seats here. I can see easily over the front headrest, but because the back seat is so high, and maybe this is due to the fact that it is that CMFCD platform, because this is very much how a T32 X-Trail feels in the back. The back seat's really high that you don't really have a whole lot of headroom. With this full-length panoramic sunroof at five foot 10, my hair is almost brushing the headlining. So I'd imagine someone that's quite tall would probably be better off to not have a model with this roof. This backrest can be adjusted though. It goes from sort of here to here, which is way better than the recline we got the other day in a new RAV4, and we can also adjust the fore aft position of the base. So we can go from pretty much there right to back here. So that's even further back than I was before. And I've still got all this knee room and tons of foot room, but not a ton of under thigh support, which again, to me, seems like something that might be related to the X-Trail because it has the same issue. Now, among the little clever bits in here in this Exceed Tourer and some other Outlander models, it has these little pockets in the back of the front seat, so you can actually fit two devices here. This Exceed Tourer has two rear mount pockets. It also has center vents in here with temperature adjustment, digital, and two three-position rear seat headers for these two outer positions. These three seats are split 40, 20, 40, so when you get the armrest to come down, instead of just grabbing it from there, you actually pull it from the middle and do that, which is again something I'm sure I've seen in an X-Trail. So to get to the cup holders, you get this little gap in between, which is no big deal really. Let's try the third row though, because that is what gives this car an extra point of difference over many of its rivals. The third row in the Outlander is not really a place for adults. The seat is not leather, it's actually vinyl. If it is leather, I'll, it's a significantly lower grade than the front, I can tell you that. This backrest is adjustable, but I can't really put it back because I can't really put my head much further back than this. The seating slide arrangement is set up 
four left-hand drives, so the smaller seat opens onto the road in Australia and not on the left, although they're roughly about the same weighting. What they don't do, though, is return to the exact position they were in before, so you've very much got to slide it into position and then hold the backrest exactly where you want it, and then it will lock. I do notice that the top tether mount for the centre middle seat is actually here, so if you're trying to put a lot of babies and kids and stuff in the back, that may be a bit of an issue. Here we do have two cup holders though, and I suppose the seats are pretty easy to wipe clean if you need to. So while the child booster seat and the baby capsule are actually really easy to fit in the Outlander, and this seat isn't all the way back, there isn't any adjustment for width in this car, and I don't know how long I could handle sitting like this. That said, I do have all the events directly in front of me, and the center transmission tunnel, which I'm actually standing on at the moment, this is in a really good position, so it could be more tolerable than many of its competitors, most of which aren't tolerable at all. Drinking 91 octane, regular unleaded, the combined fuel consumption figure for the Mitsubishi Outlander Exceed Tour is 8.1 litres per 100 kilometres. However, we averaged 8.5 litres per 100 kilometres, which is actually pretty good. The warranty for Mitsubishi in Australia is five years or 100,000 kilometres. However, if you get it serviced at every recommended service interval by a Mitsubishi dealer, it can be extended up to 10 years or 200,000 kilometres. It also has a five-year perforation and corrosion warranty. The recommended service intervals for the Outlander are every 12 months or 15,000 kilometres, with each of those first five services capped at $199, making the five-year service total for this car at just $995, which is even cheaper than a Toyota RAV4. Over the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer paid $870 to comprehensively insure a new Mitsubishi Outlander. However, everybody's situation is different and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account like where you live, whether you garage your car and your driving history. If you like this car, Chasing Cars can help you take the next step. If you'd like to arrange a test drive of the new Mitsubishi Outlander or download a brochure, please click on the link below this video. We've already discussed that the Outlander is based on a Renault Nissan platform and uses a development of Nissan's long-lived 2488cc direct injection four-cylinder, which in this case has 135 kilowatts at 6,000 RPM and 245 Newton meters, tied to a CVT transmission with eight stepped ratios. And all of that sounds about as exciting as bread and butter. But it actually does a better job than you might think. I think the one thing though that's undermining all of this is that it sounds faster than it is, if you can hear it whirring away in the background, and also that it isn't particularly quick. We have acceleration tested this car, and it did 0 to 100 in 10.3 seconds, which is right at the bottom end of its class. And that's probably why its braked towing capacity is only 1,600 kilos. Something like a Subaru Outback can do two tonnes. So this Outlander Exceed Tourer here, all-wheel drive, weighing 1,760 kilos, which is not light by any measure, is not really about performance or that sort of utility. It doesn't put the U in SUV, let's put it that way. It puts the V in it and it kind of puts the S in it because the dynamics of the Outlander are actually surprisingly good to a point. On a smooth road, Mitsubishi's enhanced active yaw control that they say is part of the all-drive system of this car and can be changed between normal and tarmac here in these two settings here, does feel actually quite pointy. It can now break the inside back wheel in the rear suspension to help it have that yaw moment and give it a little bit of torque vectoring to help it sort of go into a corner, which you can actually feel really quite positively. It really does feel surprisingly good until the weight of the car and the fact that that old Nissan 2.5 sitting ahead of the front axle line does eventually start to sort of get the front to lean over. Particularly in tighter corners, the Outlander implies more dynamism than it actually delivers because at slower speeds, this steering with only 2.6 turns lock to lock and a fairly compact 10.6 meter turning circle is actually quite sharp. It really does make the Outlander feel agile to a point, but then ultimately physics does come into play. 
the rear active yaw control and all that is doing its absolute best to keep this car neutral and it really does stay that pretty well especially on these big fat tires that the Succeed Tourer has but it's just not quite all there because as soon as it encounters bumps it all starts to fall apart these 20 inch wheels on the Aspire Exceed and Exceed Tourer do have great tyre grip but geez they must be heavy because they really do make the ride turn to shit when it's going over bad surfaces it just sort of patters about it can crash through bumps it's a shame because the actual damping of the suspension is generally reasonably okay it's just that the wheels are too big and too heavy for this car I suspect that if you bought forged alloys or trying to add a bit of Evo chic to this car and put some proper 20 inch alloys on it that were like finger light then it would transform the car's ride but as it stands if you want your Outlander to be comfortable then you need to buy an ES or an LS wearing 235 60 series 18 inch tyres and not the 20s on this one. There is a set of 18 inch wheels that Mitsubishi dealers offer as an option so you could potentially down spec your Exceed Tourer but then it wouldn't look nearly as good so I suppose you've just got to weigh up your priorities. The reason why that's a problem is because generally this car is actually a huge step forward for an Outlander. It is not class leading by any means because it doesn't have an all-rounder appeal about it. It is good at some things but not all things and then that once that sort of ride intrusion comes into play it kind of pulls it all apart really like even that back seat behind me which we're on a very smooth row here and you can't hear it when it's on any kind of uneven surface the trim between the 40 20 40 backrest just constantly sort of judders and you can just hear it moving all the time which is really quite irritating but at least you can drown it out with a bow stereo so even the safety systems in this car which are quite comprehensive it does have rear AB, it does have junction AB, it has uh, Mitsubishi first cyclist and pedestrian detection for the front AB, so it has gained quite a lot in terms of its electronic safety systems from being part of the Renault Nissan Alliance. About the only area that I think it really is quite immature is the lane keep assistance. Now you can turn that on and off with just a button down here. It actually is one press on or off and remembers where you were, which is awesome. But when it's on, not only does it sort of vibrate through the steering wheel, which it already does for the um, lane departure warning, but then it also slews the steering in a bit and brakes at the same time. So it makes it a little bit look like a, a drunk trying not to tread on a small animal it's sort of along the Toyota Land Cruiser lines of sort of a little bit cumbersome it just your best to leave it off and it doesn't really come on till quite late so it waits till you're on the lane a little bit before it then decides to add this slightly amateur level of assistance revving that engine out five six five thousand eight hundred it doesn't even get to the six thousand rpm red line yet I suppose it's better refined than you'd think Something else I should point out about the Anlander, interestingly, is that the seven seat versions actually get 350 millimeter front discs and 330 millimeter rear discs, whereas the five seat versions get 320 millimeter front discs and 292 millimeter rear discs. So I suppose there is some concession towards the fact that these seven seat Outlanders, which are not necessarily a small medium SUV and do weigh a considerable amount, have the stopping power to support that. All of which leaves the $51,000 Outlander Exceed Tourer where exactly? I think as a piece of design in terms of being something that people notice, it's actually really quite successful. And it is definitely a big step up for Mitsubishi. But I don't think that this is the best variant of the car. I think if you stick to an all drive version, because then you get this quite competent and almost kind of playful active yaw control to make the all drive system be able to overcome the car's weight then that's where it's at and that to me is an Outlander LS level at $40,000 not Exceed Tourer at fifty-one. dollars and what ultimately makes that $51,000 Exceed Tourer amount seem a little bit rich is that unlike things like 
the Mazda CX-5 and the Volkswagen Tiguan and other rivals, even the Toyota RAV4 with its hybrid system, the Exceed Tourer has the same engine that a $34,000 ES has. And so it doesn't really have that additional layer of expense on top of the fact when you're paying all that amount of money. So if you do want something special in an Outlander, you'll need to wait for the plug-in hybrid version that comes in the middle of 2022. But until now, this is more about the tinsel on top rather than the engineering underneath. So if you haven't subscribed, please do so below the video. Let us know what you think about the fourth generation Mitsubishi Outlander and whether you would prefer the petrol over the plug-in hybrid or vice versa, or whether they should do a rally art version because that'd be cool, or a comment on chasing cars. Thanks for watching.